Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today as a part of the United Nations Sustainable Food System Program. Excited to share the next 90 minutes with all of you in this unique panel. Um, let me introduce you very quickly, briefly. I'm Jan Bergensch, founder of Rural PM. I lead uh, change and education programs at Rural PM. After witnessing environmental erosion and participating in group studies in EU Horizon program, we established Rural PM in 2016 to provide transformational training, social return investment, uh, tourism, and incubation programs for government bodies, private institutes, public private institutes, and the, for early stage uh, entrepreneurs. As an incubator and education institution specialized in management and organizational transformation, our primary mission is simple, upscaling management capacities of agriculture and food system actors to protect environmental and gastronomic legacies. Um, let me clarify our panel structure. Our topic is modernizing mindset and operating models for food system actors. During our three debate blocks, which will be current landscape of our food systems, drivers and outcomes, and future horizons, which will be able to answer practical insights based on what are the key drivers and issues in today's food system landscape? What steps do we need to take in order to transform how organizations think and operate in the food system space? How do we envision the future of food system landscape and what learning and challenges will it present for our organizations. And towards the end, we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A, questions and answers to include everyone into our debate. Hope everyone's bringing their best questions. Um, before passing the microphone to our unique speakers, I'd like to give a little brief intro about them. We have Roger Spitz, world leading authority on foresight, sustainability and transformative innovation. His latest book, Disruption as a Springboard to Value Creation, became a bestseller on Amazon. He is a president of the Existential and chairman of the Disruptive Future Institute. Thank you for joining us, Roger, today. We have Sharon Cetone, founder and CEO of Edible Planet Venture. Sharon has been at the forefront of building and growing the global food and agri-tech ecosystem for the better part of a decade. Sharon, thank you for being with us today. Our next, speaker, our next speaker is well-known expert on culinary matters with over 40 years of experience, Chris Kwetke, a corporate executive chef at Ahinomoto Health and Nutrition and the chairman of Feed the Planet Committee of World Chef. Chris, thank you for your presence today. My pleasure. And finally, we have Sonali Figueras, sustainability expert and food futurist, founder and editor-in-chief, Green Queen, and co-founder and CEO of Source Screen and Echo Warehouse. Sonali, thank you for having me. So nice to be here. And I'd like to give a short introduction about our panel background. Dear participants and speakers, it's my pleasure to be here today to discuss an issue that is critical to the sustainability of our planet and well-being of our future generations, the transformation of our food systems. As we all know, the food system connected with ecological and health system faces a number of challenges. Nearly 690 people suffer from chronic hunger and malnutrition, which is caused by a complex array of factors including war, erosion, and inadequate investments in agriculture and infrastructure. Current and sustainable agriculture practices prioritize short-term gains over long-term sustainability, leading to soil degradation, water pollution, biodiversity loss. And today we have 25% of our population faces water scarcity. Globally, one third of our all food produce is wasted each year, equal to 10% of our global CO2 emissions which is 40% more since the Industrial Revolution. These challenges require us to think and design differently about how we produce, distribute, and consume, which is not only sustainable, 
unsustainable, but is also contributing to the destruction of our environment and widening the widening of social and economic um, inequalities. Continuous learning and transformation according to our changing habitat is a must. We cannot continue the same with the same collective attitudes, organizational paradigms, frameworks, or operational and business models to fabricate food that have been in place for decades. Food is just not a basic need, but a fundamental human right. However, our current dysfunctional systems in place are failing us constantly, risking our tomorrows. To overcome these critical challenges, we need to transform the way organizations think and operate in food systems. The, this, organization, this transformation needs to be centered around sustainability, equity, and resilience. It's no longer enough to focus exclusively on profit, profits and growth. We, have, we need to take into account the social and environmental impact of our actions. Firstly, we need to prioritize sustainability. Our food systems need to be regenerative, not extractive. We need to produce food in the way that preserves and enhances our natural resources, not depletes them. Secondly, we need to prioritize food is a basic human right, yet millions of people around the world do not have access to safe, nutritious, and affordable food. We need to ensure that everyone, regardless of their socioeconomical status, has access to healthy food. And lastly, we need to prioritize resilience, diminishing fragmentation and silos. Yes, our food systems needs to be adaptable to change, whether it be due to climate change, economical instability, or other factors. We need to build food systems that are diverse, decentralized, regenerative, and community-led, rather than relying on centralized and monocultural systems. In conclusion, the transformation of our food system is critical to the sustainability of our planet and the well-being of our future generations. We need to prioritize sustainability, equity, and resilience in our approach to food systems and pioneer organizations must lead the way. And it's up to us to ensure that we have healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable food for our generations to come. I'll, take, I'll thank you again for coming and encourage you to stay um, involved in the issue and help us find more transformation stories. Before we begin our first debate, current landscape of our food system, let's get to know more about our distinguished speakers. I'm going to turn to Roger. Roger, thank you for joining. That's great. Thanks, Kanberg, for um, <clears throat> setting up and uh, coordinating such an important uh, debate. So I'm Roger Spitz, I'm based in San Francisco. I have a, I guess we're all kind of unique and unusual. Um, I am included in that. I used to be an investment banker. I was global head of mergers and acquisitions covering technology for 20 years. And over the past six, seven years, decided to um, professionalize becoming a futurist. So I'm a professional foresight strategist and spend time trying to understand systemic transformation as opposed to more focused on just uh, the day-to-day -day more uh, linear transactions so i'm really very focused on what constitutes transformative innovation and change in complex systems and i still have a hat on the sort of investment side so i'm a partner of a venture capital fund which is looking at the future of mobility and I also spend time with the Berkeley Skydeck, the accelerator, which has a lot of deep tech, including in these ecosystems, um, where I kind of uh, advise. So great to be here and look forward to the, to the exchanges. Excellent. Now we turn to Sharon Gittone. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, Kamberg. Um, uh, yes, my company is Edible Planet Ventures. We act as a, an ecosystem platform to champion innovation and solutions, uh, accelerate innovation through a, a ecosystem-based consulting, if you will. And we help uh, innovation grow and scale through uh, our work with startups. I also mentor uh, three um, accelerators to food system, uh, food innovation, and one climate tech. 
I advise two funds. Um, my For the better part of a decade, I have been focused on food, but my background comes from something very different. I was head of marketing for a big fashion house, and then I went into entertainment. And then the light bulb sort of uh, switched on, and I decided to do something a lot more impactful with my time and my life. So I'm very happy to be here. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this platform with all of you. Wonderful to have you. Chris, Chris Kotke, welcome. So, yes, thank you. And I think Roger said we're all sort of, uh, I'm not sure what the word was, special, unique. <laughs> and so I probably fit into that category. Uh, I am a chef and I'll be really representing the, the kind of the food service world uh, today. But um, yeah, my background is in, is in fine dining, uh, then I spent 20 years in education um, globally, and currently um, the executive corporate chef for a company called Ajinomoto uh, for their North American division. But the reason I'm here today is, is to um, represent an organization called World Chefs, and World Chefs is kind of like the United Nations of National Chef Societies. And so we represent about, I don't know, 110, 115 countries uh, and their national chef societies. So we literally represent millions of chefs and cooks around the globe. And within that structure, um, I am the chair of what's called the Feed the Planet Committee. And so that is a committee that is solely focused on uh, sustainable efforts education, and, uh, and also some, some wonderful philanthropic uh, activities. And so we work in partnership with the Electrolux Food Foundation and with an organization called Isaac International uh, and some other partners like Custom Culinary. And so together we, we achieve, I think, some pretty, pretty neat goals. Um, the educational piece, so we, you know, we speak to professionals and I'll, I'll talk about that later, but in addition to that, we also use what we call the power of the white jacket, the power of the chef jacket to, to shape society around us. Uh, one of our initiatives, we have talked about sustainable eating and food waste and taught well over 100,000 children around the world about that because we know that when we teach the children, they take it home and they teach the parents and it, and it has this wonderful sort of growing effect. Um, and then we also have a program, I mentioned philanthropic, where we provide uh, an education into uh, culinary arts for people who are very economically disadvantaged. It's a free education, and it happens in around 10 different locations around the world and growing. And then once, once these students graduate, they go on to uh, employment, or sometimes they start their own uh, sustainable businesses. And we just graduated our thousandth student uh, about three months ago. So we, uh, we have a pretty big impact around the world. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent to have you, Chris. Thank you. And finally, we have Sonali Figueras. Welcome, Sonali. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. So um, I, like everyone else, I have a bit of a diverse background, but um, I think my the most relevant one here is that I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen. So we're one of um, Asia's largest medias, and we are the largest for all sustainability and climate-related news. And then globally, we're a major voice on everything future food, um, particularly with regards to alternative protein and just food and climate. Um, I became interested in this topic uh, about seven or eight years ago when I realized the connection between dietary change and fighting the climate crisis and how important it was. The idea with Green Queen is really to platform um, solutions and founders and organizations who are making food um, the center of our climate crisis fight because on the national and international stage, um, in most countries and across the world, food still remains not talked about enough as a major solution for um, the climate crisis. We still focus all our policy and most of the media on energy and transport and things like smart cities when food is, of course, one third of all emissions globally. 
So it's really important to broaden that, that conversation and really make that connection for readers and for uh, professionals. So we, we reach people all over the world. Um, we have a bit of an interesting kind of B to C to B model where our content is read by regular consumers and, and readers and people, but also by a lot of the industry. Um, the idea is also to make sure that Asia has a voice at the table and not just Asia, but Latin America and you know EMEA and, and um, Africa and the Middle East. Um, most of the conversations around food and climate, unfortunately, at the mainstream media level are happening very loudly in the United States and, and to Europe and Europe to some extent. But of course, 60% of the world um, lives in Asia, and we only have 20% of the world's agricultural land, and most population growth will take place here and in Africa. So it's absolutely vital for us to have a seat at the table and for our perspectives to be in included, which they are not. So there's a, a big diversity um, and geographical breadth um, kind of mission to our work um, to make sure that the conversation is, is, is broader. Yeah. Awesome. Also, thank you for joining. Wonderful to have you and have you all. Shall we dive into the uh, first block of our debate, which will be the uh, current landscape, our current landscape of our food system? And to all of you, how do you see the today's food system landscape? How organizations adapt to today's fragile and unpredictable landscape conditions? A broad question, I know. Who wants to start? Um, I'll tell you my opinion. Our landscape is very, very bad. <laughs> Everything about it is bad. Um, we have built uh, uh, a food system, a landscape that is based on uh, massive production, based on yield based on more, 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 and that's why we waste so much. Um, whereas in my opinion, this uh, very linear landscape needs to be transformed and we can transform it through uh, policy, through regenerative practices and business models, through better care, uh, of the planet as much as people health. Today, uh, the food we produce is at times toxic, uh, but people eat it. And we've seen an increase in uh, diseases and allergies and diabetes. Uh, and uh, we have definitely destroyed biodiversity. We have destroyed soil health. Uh, so we need to fix it. That is sort of my opinion. It's not a happy one. I do believe we have a very broken food system. You know, I'll I'll jump in and and you know, I would completely concur with what you said. And the analogy that I tend to to give, uh, and it's a and it's a really frustrating one, is that as a species, we are 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 driving towards a cliff. And everyone around us is telling us there's a cliff. And at some point, we drive off of it. And the rational response to that should be to slow down and eventually stop and change direction. And yet, as a species, what we're doing is speeding up. And I think when I, I hear people, for instance, around climate change, sort of say, like, and it, it concerns me greatly in the news, um, you know, it's just accepted. The earth is warming up. It's going to warm up some more. We have to adjust. No, that's not actually, the, that, that, that should not be the way we view this. It shouldn't be we, we will adjust and we'll just drive off the cliff and somehow it'll work. No, the warning bells are going off. And for us just to accept that this is the way it is going to be is in many ways accepting disaster. And so Sharon, I, I agree with you. And there's so much that we can talk about because we have to do things differently. And if we don't, and I'll talk about this later, the economic drivers will cause us to change, 
but by the time that happens, the pain that will be felt as a human species will be intense. So that's the challenge in front of us. Thank you, Chris. So one one aspect which I <clears throat> which I try and think about a lot is, uh, you know, when we look at what Sharon's describing, those food systems better than I am. I'm not necessarily a, a specialist in that segment. Is one would imagine that there's less infrastructure or less kind of legacy than power or energy or transport for food systems. But I guess somehow one of the challenges is how much is embedded, not just in habits on the consumption side, also on the production side and, and those who sort of participants to the, to the food systems, but also some kind of infrastructure is obviously probably not the word for food systems, but how much is kind of embedded which is difficult to shift in the same way as infrastructure and mobility, the all kind of interconnections in the complex real world um, that are legacy. And so any transition which is hitting a piece of it and not thinking systemically through the chain um, is, is tricky. And so when you add to that the governance systems and the incentives that aren't necessarily um, supportive of change, um, you end up with uh, effectively a lot of a uh, embedded um, system structures which which are not necessarily conducive to change so you know it's part of the topic of changing mindsets but how do you incorporate this sort of physical risk into the decision making how do you design for changing climate conditions and what we need to do how do we identify the dependencies and then change the governance and incentive systems to allow systemic transformation um, so that all the, the significant initiatives that are taking place by, by many constituents are actually effective to move the needle as a virtuous inflection point kind of thing. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, we still live in a, in a world where and you know, you produce, you you grow something, I don't know, in California, then you process it, then you ship it to China for packaging, and then this gets shipped, you know, everywhere else in the in the world where and we don't uh support these local food systems as much as we should do, you know, uh, to buy something that it's imported imported from, you know, a, a country in Africa, it's cheaper than an apple, you know, from an organic farmer that is 10 kilometers away. Uh, there's, I think, a lot of, um, of things that we, we need to change and corporations need to change and to really get the problem, not just, you know, put it in their, you know, sustainability report, but how do we truly uh, shift in a profitable way because it's not that being sustainable it's not being profitable there's ways to make money but you need that push to to make things happen and that's where your mindset comes in how do we really do that right on this point exactly so how do you see an organizations adapt or slash manipulate the changing consumer demands and expectations because you always expect affordable cheap you know um those kind of buzzwords how organizations are doing that part are they adapting or are they influencing in another way that they shouldn't and you know reading the demands and expectations of the consumers how they're how they're doing their this part i i can give it a shot um um but i'm sure you're, you're, everyone has, will have perspective on this i I think it's uh, organizations are cabled currently to, <clears throat> for, for most of them, to deliver on their primary um, remit, which is maximize shareholder value. So we're in a sort of shareholder primacy context. Having said that, I, I very much agree to Sharon's point, which is ultimately, it's not, there's no inconsistency between sustainability and shareholder primacy. Well, the, there's no inconsistency between making money and being profitable 
and sustainability. It's just that you have to understand a more kind of broader stakeholder ecosystem and stakeholder perspective, but you can still, um, and many companies do, make a lot of money from sustainability. So they're not incompatible. Um, however, organizations do remain cable to, to incentive structures, which today favor certain time horizons, certain decisions, certain outcomes. Um, they're also not oblivious to, to demand. And ultimately, there is some demand. Fortunately, it's increasing, but unfortunately, it's not enough, which is shifting towards different tastes and that. So if you take the meat industry, I mean, I thought it was quite interesting to see, you know, whether it's JBS, which acquired, you know, Vivera as a, as a plant based in the Netherlands, whether it's um, Luten Food, one of the sort of Dutch premium manufacturers, which is kind of partnered with um, a very interesting company called Orbillion Bio in, in, the, in California here. Um, and even some of the Tyson Foods and Cargill and others are sort of shifting to this segment of alternative protein. I think the challenge is that some of them did it really just as a kind of tick the box and did a U-turn since because it became difficult to integrate fully to, within a very short time scale remain competitive um in terms of economics and i think one of the challenges as well is is really sort of the time horizons which companies are looking at ultimately it's a look like it's a bit like any new new innovation or technology there's you know amara's law you underestimate in the long term the benefits but overestimate in the short term so when companies are thinking in the, the normal way they're cabled, they're kind of expecting very quick turn, very quick returns. If that isn't delivered immediately, they might sort of shift strategy. And in all likelihood, probably with a sort of slightly broader, deeper, more thoughtful and longer time frame, they would actually get more by those initial optionality they're developing early on, but some of them just kind of cut short on that. And so for me, that is really the question, how, you know, to get virtuous inflection points, both at the individual organizations level and more kind of broadly, where things do scale, things do move um, in a way that, um, that are not just kind of ad hoc initiatives that you can do a very long list of. And I'm sure, you know, Somali in uh, Green Queen probably has 10 articles a day. Which, which talk about how many incredible fundraisings and initiatives, et cetera. The question is, is how much of them are kind of moving the needle and together is it sort of a sufficient inflection point within the time frame that humanity needs um, for it to be effective for the broader problem we have as opposed to just specific ad hoc you know, news items. Sure, um, maybe I'll step in at, at, um, now. Um, so a few things come to mind. Number one, I think, this doesn't get discussed enough, which is that food is not transport. Food is not energy. Food is incredibly personal and incredibly tied to identity, um, tradition, family. For most people, food is their grandmother, their their parents, you know, their their family table, and that makes it a unique challenge. That is not the same as you know incentivizing someone to change their car. So there's a lot of work that really needs to be done when it comes to things like behavioral science and understanding how we make decisions about food and why. And really a lot more work around, you know, our, our human behavioral psychology, which we, we really leave aside because we live in a very market-led kind of invisible hand kind of world view. Um, two, I think that we have to be really careful not to come at this with um, you know, anger for people's choices. Um, most people, not probably the people in that that we all know, but most humans on the planet are living a life of survival and they're likely doing their best to survive. And within that kind of framework, it's complicated for them to take on huge questions around the foods that they eat. Um, and that's where it's really important to remember that government policy has a huge role to play here, whether you know, you're know you someone who is a conservative or not politically, um, we're not gonna get anywhere without some form of policy. Now you can make it a carrot or a stick and that's a different debate, but certainly it is not up to the consumer to fix everything. 
you know, it's certainly not up to our 16 year old to fix everything. Um, so that's that's really something something else I, I really think is important to underline. And then the other really important point here, and I think it's another one that you know not enough people are talking about. There is no silver bullet here. There is no one solution that will save us. Um, we really need to be looking at a basket of different solutions to work together. And I know that in the industry, I spend a lot of time in in alternative proteins and and food tech. It's a very kind of single solution mentality. You know, it's very like techno solution led. And there is nothing in the world that has worked on its own in terms of like technological advancement. Everything has required collaboration. Even the geniuses of Silicon Valley built all their work on the backs of government policy, funding, um, taxpayer money, and and research between public and private institutions. And so we really need to change the ideas, the idea that, you know, okay, it's gonna be cultivated meat or it's gonna be regenerative agriculture. No, it's likely gonna be a blend of all in the same way that there isn't one perfect country and there isn't one perfect business and there isn't one perfect type of human. There is not one perfect solution. And I don't see enough of this kind of multi-solution approach. I see a lot of just factioning and siloed thinking. Um, and one of the things that is the saddest thing to me as someone who both believes in technology for, a, for a, a sustainable and safe and ethical future of food, but also is a food lover and comes from a very long line of, of, of home cooks, um, is that there is a huge disconnect between people who, who make food and people who want to use technology to save food. And that's an example of where we've lost our way a little bit and we really need to come back together um, and really look at this as it's a broad toolkit. And one of those tools is also gonna be policy. And one of those tools is gonna be understanding how we make decisions around food so that we can come at this with some empathy around how busy, most busy people are just doing the best with what they have. Sure, there are some bad actors, but most people are not making bad food decisions because they hate the planet or their family's health. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna follow that up because those were wonderful points. And you know, one of the things that we do at World Chefs is um, and and our our model within the Feed the Planet is really centered around education. It's education to inspire and to inspire people to change. And it's really interesting because, you know, as you were just mentioning about how normal people are busy and have a lot going on, and in many instances, just trying to survive. When it comes to people in the food world, you know, the food service world, which is an enormously big sector and has a huge impact on food that's being produced and, you know, et cetera. People are extremely busy. <laughs> and so, you know, the opportunity for them to, to, to learn about what change can be and why change has been really something we have focused on. Because when we started doing this, what we discovered is that, you know, chefs want to kind of do the right thing. They just don't know. And it's not that they're, you know, they're, they're not smart. They're just so busy. And so what we did is we developed different models to deliver a, a, a comprehensive curriculum for them so that they could learn in little pieces when they have 15 minutes here and 10 minutes here and 20 minutes there completely online, or it can be through, you know, the hundred and some trainers we have around the world to actually learn about what are the actual issues that are happening in our world and to learn about it in a very comprehensive way. And what, we've, what we have learned is that the minute that people understand what's happening, why it's happening, and here are some ideas for how you can implement change quickly, never forgetting that in our world, we, we live in the world of, of you know, profit, right? It's a business. And so, you know, if somebody says, I want to be super sustainable and I'm starting to lose money, that's not a sustainable solution. And so when you put that all together, 
and you say, this is how you do it, and this is how you attract more customers, and this is how you can actually, by reducing your food waste, you actually have a more profitable operation, all of a sudden people listen. And many times, you know, and you said very correctly, food is a very personal thing. I mean, as chefs, we know that we cook for the people who are eating it, but we can also reset expectations and we can change behaviors little by little in some instances, but we can. And I think that's a role that we, that we embrace, but it only starts when people are educated and know, you know, why you can't just walk in and say, you need to change because people go, I'm too busy for that, whatever. No. But when you get into why, and then you show them how, that's when, and that's what we have seen, that's when change happens. I think it's, I mean, every country is different and every country has also a regulatory process that is different, you know, to approve or not approve certain technologies. Uh, Europe, the US, the FDA, different than uh, EFSA. Uh, but it's also, we live in a world where we are feeding the 1% extremely well and forgetting that there is many people that really struggle and they would not love nothing less than feed their children properly instead of, you know, getting what they even know is bad food. But you have to have food, have good food accessible to everyone. So there's, you know, in my opinion, there are so many uh, for every country, for every segment of the population, you need to diversify solutions with that one objective. You know, how do we feed people the best food possible at an accessible price? And that to me is blended, blended types of methods and technology, depending on whether the warm or you know cold weather whether you know they do or don't like something blended capital you know diversified investments policy that you know and i believe in the carrot and the stick to put them together you know tax the ones that are doing bad and you know incentivize those that are doing good and i think there are examples out there of companies that prove to be extremely profitable by doing the right thing so how do we, you know, just spread that, right? How do we, the concept is proven. We just have to get to, you know, the most people and slowly say, you know, we can move the needle in that direction through a collaborative effort. That's sort of my point. Awesome. On this point, um, Sharon, Sonali, based on your experiences and what you guys are uh, doing at the moment, could you a little bit explain, actually, zoom in about the food innovation landscape to overcome what we have been talking? Sure. Do you mean like an overview of kind of what are the different sectors and, and what's out there? Exactly. On the given landscape, the problems that we have, there are some innovative uh, initiatives, not technologically, but the way they have approach also to the solutions. How is the landscape on the food innovation? Sure, I mean, actually technology is, is a large part of, of what's going on. Maybe I can talk more about the food tech side and maybe Sharon, do you wanna do the ag tech and that way we can split it? Um, so on the food tech side, there, there is basically one, one of the biggest problems that we have right now in our food system is that we're overly dependent on livestock agriculture to produce meat and dairy. And currently 77% of agricultural land is used to raise livestock if you count where they live and also the land that we use to um, grow their feed. And livestock agriculture is linked to a whole host of issues, um, in, in, including a huge chunk of our global emissions budget, 14 to 80, 18%. So um, there's no way that we can solve climate, um, the climate crisis and its consequences without addressing our dependency on animal agriculture. But the problem is, is that we have a growing population and that Bennett's law, as people get richer, they want more animal foods. And so demand is going up. 
land is restricted, water is restricted, energy is restricted, and also we have issues with things like deforestation, which is um, a by a, a by problem of this industry. Um, so, which also means we we have a biodiversity loss and wildlife habitat loss, and then of course we have things like superbug resistance because we're stuffing animals with antibiotics that are going into our bodies and then we have an issue. And then of course the worst, the one that we're all very familiar with because we lived through a global pandemic is you know, zoonotic diseases and their rise that is linked to the fact that animal agriculture is taking away um, wild animal habitats. And so wild animal diseases are, are jumping over to domesticate animals. So that's a packet of, of, of problems that we need to solve. Um, but protein is, is sort of an un, non-negotiable part of our diet. Um, probably in the global north, we all consume too much protein per capita, but in the rest of the world, that is not the case at all. And in the global south, the protein per capita is still too low. And it's incredibly important for development, especially for brain development. So there's sort of a protein imbalance, there's protein injustice, and then there's protein demand growth that we need to figure out a solution for. And so there's a category of technology, food technology that is called alternative proteins. Some people call it smart proteins. Some people call it sustainable proteins. But essentially, the idea is to produce animal proteins or proteins that can replace animal proteins without using livestock agriculture. And there are many different technologies, but let's cover the four main ones that are existing today. One is plant-based technology, which is essentially using um, things like extrusion to use plant isolates, so pea, soy, chickpea, mung bean, get their protein isolate and then put them through an extrusion process to essentially end up with a texture that replicates animal-like meat. Um, and that is the most common of all those technologies. There are over 800 companies worldwide working on this technology across the world. And in most grocery stores now across the world, you can find some example of this. In some parts of the world, there are many examples. Um, this is also the section that works on things like plant-based dairy. There's also plant-based seafood. There's also plant-based um, cheese, right? But the second pillar, um, which is uh, very lit in, available in a very limited amount, but is starting to gain traction is called precision fermentation. And that is a technology whereby you program microorganisms like microbes or um, yeast, and you program them with DNA from an animal, and but without using an animal, you use a DNA sequence that you get online in a library, and you basically program them to recreate an animal protein, like a whey protein, or a casein protein, or an albumin protein for an egg. And that allows you to basically get a protein that is molecularly identical to the animal version, but without the animal. And that technology is especially being used to recreate things like uh, milk and ice cream and yogurt and, and, and certain kinds of cheese. Mm -hmm. um, and actually that technology is very old. It's the same technology that we use to make insulin for type one diabetics. So it is not a new technology. Um, it has just not been applied at a mass scale to food. Um, and some of those products are already in the market. Um, here in Hong Kong, we have ice cream and milk that is made using that technology. Um, in the US, there are all there are maybe 20 different brands using this type of technology. And then there's a third pillar, which is cellular agriculture, or as we like to call in the industry, cultivated meat. And that is essentially actually taking a cell from animals, and it can be from, uh, you know, a cow, it can be from a pig, it can be from a chicken, it can also be from a fish. Um, so it, it's also for seafood. And essentially you 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 put that cell in um, a medium, a growth medium, and you give it food, usually sugars, and you grow it inside a bioreactor. So you're essentially growing real animal flesh, but instead of growing it inside the body of an animal, you're growing it inside a bioreactor. So that is actually uh, identical physically to the flesh of an animal. That technology is very early stage. Um, there is only one country in the world that has legalized that technology, and they've only legalized it for a few products from one company, and that is Singapore. And the company is Eat Just's Good Meat Division. Um, and currently, that is the only place in the world where you can actually go and try it, and it is in a very limited scale. That technology is not available globally. It is not ready for mass uh, scale at all. It, 
the costs are too high and the scaling technology just in terms of infrastructure is not there yet. But obviously it is a very, very exciting technology for the future because it means that if we can, if we can figure it out, it means that we can actually grow any kind of animal flesh that we want. Um, it's very exciting, especially for things like seafood, because as you know, we're also depleting the oceans. We spend a lot of time talking about agriculture, but the ocean, there is no way we can fight climate change without um, without stopping our kind of takeover of all marine wildlife. Um, and then there's other technologies like molecular farming and solid state or biomass fermentation. That, that one, the biomass fermentation involves using a lot of times mycelium um, or mycoprotein from, um, from basically uh, different types of fungi and mushroom and re using basically recreating um, meat-like textures in also um, these type of bioreactors, but with it's a different technology. Um, and that's also minimally available in the market. There's a few companies in the US that are that have that out. And then a very famous example of that of a form of that technology is corn, um, a vegetarian uh, alternative meat alternative company that's been around for a long time. Um, that is a very exciting area because there's a lot of pushback. Um, around certain types of plant-based meat that they are very processed and solid state fermentation allows you to get um, a mycelium-based product that is less, let's call it processed, mycelium being the substrate root of mushrooms. Um, so that's just a quick overview of some of the technologies that we're looking at to find alternatives to protein as our protein demand is growing exponentially. I'll let Sharon cover stuff, the exciting stuff going on in ag tech. Yes, um, I think also because Chris is here, we have ag tech, food tech, obviously grocery tech, retail tech, restaurant tech. So to me, technology, every area of our food system is, is being innovative. Um, and these solutions are there to help, um, you know, the past become the future and become more sustainable. So in terms of, um, farming, and I think some overlapped, uh, like robotics and automation, we find them obviously in agriculture, but we also find, you know, them in food service, robotic arms that make the pizza, um, or automation for grocery stores. So those are definitely two things that are helping become more efficient, whether a farm or, um, uh, you know, uh, midstream sort of technologies or the grocery store or a restaurant. Uh, we have precision farming. So basically, how do we make farming efficient? How do we reduce all the waste that goes around in farming? How can we plant a seed uh, and make sure that it grows because a weather storm is not coming the next day to sort of wash it away? Um, so anything that helps our farming to become more efficient, sensors, drones, um, uh, software, hardware that you can implement on the farm. So that is called precision farming. Um, and also, I think and this is very high tech. There is also something that is very low tech, which is regenerative agriculture. It doesn't involve, you know, big technology, but it involves sort of stepping back and looking at what farming was before. Uh, so look, working on the microbiome of the soil, on restoring soil, soil health to uh, ro do crop rotation, no tilling. So step diverse practices that go to and restoring what agriculture should be. Um, and it's not yield based, which is what agriculture it is today. So farming, water, uh, obviously also automation in uh, uh, water, it's very important. And we have also uh, controlled environment agriculture. So precision farming in the farm controlled environment is um, companies, many different ones. You could have vertical farms growing lettuce, berries, in a controlled environment. You could have greenhouses uh, on top of roofs, sort of uh, like Gotham Greens in New York. Um, so, or you could have them in supermarkets or in your home. How do we can grow uh, food, lettuce or berries 
uh, in a controlled environment where we don't have to uh, use our soil. So in terms of agriculture, there is a lot, but there's also, I, I think, um, so many different technologies that are very useful throughout the whole food system that are worth you know, mentioning and knowing that they are there for every step of it. You know, I'm I'm just going to follow it up really quickly in terms of the world of of food service because it is it is a little bit of, you know, looking forward and looking back at the same time. Uh, Sharon, I think you kind of alluded to that a little bit. You know, because there there are technological advances that are 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 really fascinating. You know, and you know everything that you know, was mentioned about, you know, precision fermentation and cellular technologies, you know, that's, that's great. In our world, um, we do rely more and more on technology to solve some of our problems, which can include things like, you know, food waste. If we have things that can cook things in a more precise way that don't rely on, on human, uh, you know, humans to monitor it because that's where mistakes happen, then we waste less, right? Which is great. But I also just wanted to throw out one, one other thought here because there's a lot of discussion today about alternative proteins, which are which is interesting, which is you know fascinating, and there have been real strides made there. At the same time, one of the big things that we as a food community have focused on is resetting the expectation for the foods that people eat. And in other words, it's, you know, it's called the flipped plate, which is, it's not about putting, you know, as when I started in the business, everything started with what is the protein on the plate? And then what do you put around it? You know, you start with a chicken breast, you start with a steak, you start with a piece of fish, you start with shrimp, and then what goes with it? Today, the focus is starting to shift about what is the vegetable that's going to be in the middle of the plate? And then what are the things we're gonna build around it? And where does the protein go? And what are sources of protein that we can use that are very traditional that are very sustainable? You know, because there's a lot of ways of getting protein into you know, our, our bodies that doesn't rely completely on animal sources. And this is where the challenge comes in for people who are in the chef world, not only in terms of what they're serving in their restaurants, but the example that they're serving for the rest of the community, where now it's, you know, like in the States, there's a lot of restaurants where you go in and there's a, a cauliflower steak. And we have made that cool. <laughs> not just a, oh, I really wish I could have a real steak. But now people are actually excited about eating that. And we can reset those expectations. And I think that's you know, one or part of the solution for how we get out of the mess that we've created. Right on this point, Chris, thank you. So talking about the drivers, okay, about the how people are adapting um, instead of meat, they're prioritizing vegetables and uh, alternatives. How do you see what are the main drivers of mindset that organization are operating in food system landscape? How do they impact their decision-making process? Because you're doing a many engineering, you're affecting the choices and you're um, trying to provide a, a value that has been provided previously, meat example, like you were saying. How, how is that, how is that uh, dynamic of shaping the mindset of organizations in the food landscape, food system landscape? And to me, there's not a one size fit all. I mean, and we've seen a lot of examples of companies that might have a visionary CEO, but might be too visionary or, you know, corporates, especially in food. I mean, farmers get the short end of the stick, but a lot of the food we produce have very, very low margins, right? There's not a lot of revenue. It's called uh, due diligence, basically. Um, Thank you. Um, so, you know, a company is never just one person. You have to 
you know, make the shareholders happy. You have people that are, you know, sales team that is getting their quotas. So you might have a great innovation department, but the rest of the company might be on a very different page. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's, that's the difficulty. It's not like everybody's on the same page. And sometimes you get lucky with a great CEO, like Paul Pullman was, that saw the bigger picture, but also saw the need to, you know, sort of the short term, you know, day to day stuff was getting done. Um, and that is not something you find often, unfortunately, in my opinion. I think one of the interesting things we've we've kind of all touched upon is um, obviously the importance of education mindsets, and then what constitute change. So, you know, when you look at sorry to bring it up again, but <clears throat> when you look at different considerations around sustainability and the energy transition, there are certain features which are either enablers or hindrances to driving change and. Of course, food is different from mobility, is different from energy, et cetera. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the drivers for change in a complex system are completely different. And so when we take models like, you know, Donanella Meadows, who looks at, you know, from a systemic perspective, you have some very strong levers for change and then some weaker levers. And I think <clears throat> one of the important things is, is to realize that there's no si one size fits all. And the sharing and the kind of appreciation of that comes through effectively the education, the mindsets, the assumptions, the worldviews. And that is actually the strongest lever for change. So it's not an accident that all of us in some shape or form in doing what we do have a part of our activities which are very focused on education. Myself, we set up the Disruptive Futures Institute which is purely an education platform because unless we're changing the assumptions, the mindsets, the worldviews, and I think it's the same way for Chris and his chefs and then to what's served at tables. And then indeed, consumer preferences can shift from that. And that is the, you know, stating the obvious, but, but from a kind of systemic social sciences perspective, that is the greatest driver for change. The next one is structures. So that's where regulation comes in, designing the underlying structures, which can more likely incentivize the system. So there you're looking at sustainable innovations, you're looking at government tax incentives you're looking at um, <clears throat> certain metrics which are measured which are monitored which allow feedback loops and then the incentives and the accountability around those and so i think <clears throat> when we're thinking about your question for, from my perspective um can burke around you know decision makers or organizations what are they doing or not doing ultimately those who are doing it successfully are most likely focusing on um the, the assumptions they're making and, and the world views of the leadership teams of the organization. And within that, at their level, because obviously they can't influence as considerably policy making as, as agencies or governments or what have you, but they can incentivize the system through appropriate accountability, disclosures, feedback loops, and incentives, because ultimately the incentives determine the outcomes. And I think <clears throat> that you know, takes different shapes and different forms and is different from one vertical to another, if we can call it that. But ultimately, those are the fundamental features that can either enable or hinder um, change in complex systems. And, and the final thing I just wanted to add, listening to, to how many times we've all said, you know, there's no one size fits all, et cetera, is a, is a, a very interesting talk, distressing, but interesting. I was at a year ago by Kim Stanley Robinson, who's a climate fiction writer, very well known, um, and he wrote The Fu Ministry of the Future. And he was looking, he was telling us that he wrote that book in 2019. I went to a talk a year ago, so 2022, about three years after he wrote the initial book. And in the book, the time frame was a 30 years time frame for which what Kim Stanley Robinson describes as utopia and he defines it as avoiding mass extinction for humanity. And in that utopia of avoiding mass extinction, he had a time frame of 30 years, which is three decades. And what he told us in 2022 is that effectively, with the unfortunately the additional data and things that have happened over the past few years, those 30 years were probably 10 years. Now, cli climate fiction is a is a genre of science fiction, but it's science led. It's very concrete and it's very much thinking short term what needs to be done. And that 
decade ahead, I think the way um, he described it was a kind of it's an all hands on deck. So of course, one needs to do things that are thoughtful and safe and, and et cetera, as much as possible. But the reality is that it's a complex problem. So there are known unknowns. There isn't a straightforward playbook. There isn't a just point solutions that you can just do X, Y, Z. Um, you have to intervene across the system along the ways we, we discussed, the worldviews, the structures, the patterns, the trends and that. Um, and you have to be experimental. So that's where all the different ideas need to be tested and, and developed and deployed, et cetera, that, that makes sense, but without relying on any individual ones and making sure you're intervening across the system. So I just wanted to share that because I think it's a common theme we're discussing and it kind of goes, goes back to what constitutes change in these complex systems and what drives decision-making for the outcomes. Thank you for this remark. And service level tactic versus the trans transformative innovation that um, I was going to ask that. How do you ensure, how do you, how do you structure that, Roger? I think it's the elements of what, what I was trying to outline. In other words, um, you know, take, so I focus, one area I focus on, I'm on the Climate Intelligence Council of, of, um, <clears throat> of a company called Service, which does climate intelligence. So climate intelligence is a, is a segment where effectively you're trying to give decision makers um, information, data to inform decision making today, but on problematics which are 10, 15 years away and which are deeply uncertain. So, and that's where kind of the, the sort of foresight or futurist hat comes in. So how do you kind of make decisions today which are deeply uncertain and for which the timeframes are longer? And effectively, <clears throat> I think one of the ways to avoid point solutions is, is to hit the different parts of the, of the value chain. So in, in their case, that's an organization which offer a very open source, simple way of seeing for your assets or even competitors' assets or any city in the world, what the likely outcomes might be in terms of climate scenarios for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You're looking at that and that kind of can build in an element of education and killing assumptions if you're kind of understanding that better. And then you're moving along the chain around how that impacts structures and that it, it ties in with disclosure of regulations in terms of what you need to disclose for emissions and then the feedback loop and it's supporting the disclosure of, of that. So I think the insofar as you're appreciating and trying to kind of integrate the, the education side, the structures, the incentives, you know, within the remit of what you can control that as an organization, you're more likely than not to be able to affect change. And then the last comment I would say is um, that in, in sort of typical startup world or for new ventures, you have, you know, what's called the, the technological value of debt, which is you prove something, um, in a discrete way before scaling and before it sort of gets commercialized, you sort of test whether there's going to be demand for it or not and hopefully raise funding. And I think if you're developing certain software or what have you, that's a relatively easy process and you can have a specific demand and there's either demand and there isn't or you raise financing or not. I think one of the challenges for, for the, the, these complex systems is a commercialization value of death where the scaling is different when you're having to integrate with complex systems and whether it's food or, or mobility or energy, there are certain features which, which are equally challenging. They're not the same, but they're equally challenging in terms of how do you scale, integrate, deploy in a way that is kind of systemic and, and interacts in a virtuous way with the rest of the ecosystem. And that's, that's really, the, there's no other option. I, I personally believe then, then thinking of the different levers of change, which again, go to assumption, worldviews, what people are prepared to do, how they make decisions, to the structures and to the different incentives and accountability for the system. Thank you very much for your remark. And about decision-making. So how enterprises, companies measure and assess their outcome of their actions in terms of social economical and, and env environmental any any analysis on that 
Is the question for something? So for someone? No. For all of you. Well, the food system, um, we don't have a unified standard, uh, which is what would give us the most impact, but we don't have that. Um, so each company can, you know, subject it to the company, whether it's uh the impact that they are trying to create in terms of sustainability to have a real impact i believe that we should have a unified standardization where we can actually measure the impact on a global scale or a national scale but now each company is uh you know doing their own thing can i just add to that term because i think it's a uh, you really hit the nail on the head that that affects obviously the decision makers and the companies. And I think it also affects equally the investors. And so ultimately you need all this to be financed. And this lack of meaningful um, impact standards where they're objective, universally accepted, consistently measured, um, make it more difficult for investors to get comfortable with it in addition to to what we discussed earlier with is what's the most compelling technology or ultimately they need to back certain things although as a system one needs to back many things each investor will be looking at a case and so that's where from our perspective the way we're cabled right or wrong we think it's correct one really cannot ignore the structures of the system because that's where the regulation the governance the incentives um, including mandatory formal metrics that allow you to measure and monitor and build in feedback loops, whether it's for the system itself to know what is actually effective or not, whether it's for the organizations that are constituents, whether it's for investors or other stakeholders. And so, you know, coming back again to, to that, that aspect of what constitutes and allows change, what Sharon's talking about to my mind, is, is really a key piece of the sort of structures as a lever for change, which, again, if you're hitting some of them and not that, it's less likely to, to shift the, towards outcomes which one deems more um, sought after. You know, this is a really interesting discussion because we've had a lot of discussions about, you know, what should be a KPI? You know, in, in, in the food world, you know, we're looking at, you know, labor, we're looking at, you know, overall profitability, we're looking at, you know, food cost. We're, we have lots of metrics and none of those metrics have anything to do with, with sustainability. I mean, I mean, none. You know, we, we tried and we've had some success in implementing um, a KPI of food waste. And you know what what we have sort of surmised is if we focus on that because it's measurable, we can impact a lot of other things in terms of how much food is purchased and the food signals that are given upstream. But even doing that is challenging. If you were to go to most restaurants today and say, so how much food waste are you producing? How much food are you actually discarding? I can pretty much guarantee you most of them would go, I don't know. <laughs> but the minute, and we have really interesting data on this, the minute that people start actually tracking it and putting goals, and now it becomes a focus. And it's really interesting because at that point, you restaurants see their food waste start to go down, which means they're buying less food which means it impacts profitability in a positive way. And that becomes a very strong argument to go to upper management. Because remember that you know chefs don't always have the end say. They may have the best of intentions, but if the people who own the place say, no, 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 or if they're part of a multinational you know, hotel chain who says, oh, no, 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 you all have to buy salmon. I don't care where you are in the world, you have to buy salmon. I don't care if you have the best you know, fishing grounds just right there, you have to buy salmon. They're, they're stuck. But if they can demonstrate that they can improve profitability, 
now all of a sudden there's a discussion to be had, but it's all about metrics. And yes, I mean, Sharon, to your point, there needs to be better metrics that are developed that are easily accessible. That, it doesn't exist today. Yeah, especially on the whole value chain. I mean, I could be a company, but I don't know where my necessarily where my food come, what comes from or the, what the farmer is doing or how he's growing his you know, crops. Or, and I think those are important metrics too. If you want to be sustainable, you have to go to you know, all the way to the beginning and then you, you know, have to go all the way to the end. You have to look at your surroundings and it can't be, I did a great project you know, in one place, but I'm destroying it on another because uh, that's pure greenwashing. So unified you know, standards and metrics, in my opinion, would be a really cool thing. I haven't asked this actually in the previous uh, question. Um, there's, a, there's a very easy calculation called social return on investment, close to ROI return on investment. But on this one, you calculate actually the social and environmental um, consequences combined with the economic ones. So when you're doing the engineering or when you're doing uh, product development, you can understand actually the, the positive and negative effects about the, about the initiative, uh, the investment that you're doing. And it could be a good metric. Maybe you have heard it because when you do, um, when you do calculations, Purely normally, I mean, organizations do the um, economical one, lucrative ones, not looking at the where does meat or avocado comes from. They don't study or they don't put in their equation uh, the social and environmental um, consequences that they're creating. The other day, I was actually before in this meeting talking with you guys, for instance, avocado is a very delicate fruit, vegetable that you're putting on the menus, but it actually affects the agriculture of some regions that they're cultivating it and is not assessed. You see uh, alarming, let's say, um, problems in, in the reports, but normally in initiatives that organizations are uh, launching, it's not very calculated for their water consumption, energy consumption. So maybe it could be, uh, a small indicator to put in into the guidelines or um, regulations that it could be it could be calculated. Difficult to calculate because you need to open lots of books and you know uh, not only um, not only financial. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? Social return investment. I can share, I'm part of a few funds as an advisor and I speak to investors every day and I gotta be honest with you, I don't know any investors who genuinely um, are, are willing to sub out returns um, without, you know, for a social impact. I, I mean, that's that's the honest truth. Um, I know that we'd like to believe otherwise, and I know that the way it looks on LinkedIn is that everyone's an impact investor now, but the, the true reality is that, you know, when you're in the room, um, the returns have to be there. There has to be a business case. There has to be a financial case. And we don't actually, today, our eco economic system does not price in the externalities that you're talking about. Do I think that we should advocate for policy to price those externalities in? Yes. Do I think there should be things like meat taxes if it, in, in certain ways or in, in a carrot way? Yes. But do I think that that's the reality now? No. And at the end of the day, investors, I, I, had, a, I had a really, um, really, really great heart to heart with an investor that I was having kind of a disagreement with about how they were doing their, their analysis of, of, of looking at deals. And they opened up to me about their stakeholder, which is LPs. And which are the part, you know, the people that put the money in their funds and they have their own, they have to answer to those people. And the answer cannot be that we chose a deal that wasn't going to make money within the, the, the constraints of our current, you know, neoliberal capitalist system. So it's really important to understand where we're at 
obviously we can provide education to do better. We can create markets for change, but I think investors have to answer to the LPs and, and we can see what's going on with funds like BlackRock and ESG led investing and, and all the backlash. I mean, we're talking about food, but you know, we could extend this over to the whole of sustainability investing. And it's just, we have not yet proven that the investor case will allow us to override the profit for the mission. So right now, the businesses that tend to get the funding and get the follow-on funding, especially now since investors are really being very cautious, are the ones that are still kind of playing the game according to, you know, profit and growth metrics and kind of, you know, capitalist, your, your, your run-of-the-mill capitalist criteria. I, I know we'd like to believe otherwise, but I, I think it's a bit of a fantasy, especially since the last 12, 15 years of, you know, you know, no, no interest rates and like, you know, um, unlimited growth have just been kind of capped and we're entering a different kind of fiscal world or we've already entered it. So I think we need to be realistic. Hmm. And that's where we need policies, like maybe government incentives for funds to, you know, match investment if there is an impact coefficient or, you know, better ways to measure the return on impact and align it with return on financial incentives. I, I, I just, I, I think we're being unrealistic if we don't recognize that investors are returns led. And that's just the way the capitalist cookie crumbles. So are companies. But I just, Sorry. just. And so are corporates. Of, of course, well, they're shareholder led. So if they're public and if they're private, well, they probably can move the lever in their own way. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I agree uh, 200% with everything that's being said. I'll just, just make the following <clears throat> buckets and distinctions. I think, first of all, one can have meaningful impact standards and such as carbon emissions, and those are in the process of very advanced legislation so that ultimately it'll be regulated. It might not be exactly measuring every aspect we would like to, but there are some meaningful regulations, um, not least carbon emissions, which, which are about to go through in multiple jurisdictions, which will move the needle, which will then allow accountability feedback loops. At that point, it's no longer just a question of wishful thinking that the world is more friendly or stakeholder-led versus shareholder primacy. At that point, <clears throat> that becomes an obligation, and therefore there's no other choice than to disclose that, report on it, and have those feedback loops. And then organizations can decide to incentivize their leadership teams or the shareholders can continue to maximize value. But because that's disclosed, they'll need to integrate the negative impact on their share price or other um, demand led by virtue of disclosing things that might be very adverse. So I do think that without being a sort of the utopia of tracing everything from a social perspective, there are some concrete advanced aspects of legislation sure. that are about to be implemented. The second thing is that, indeed, some of it is going to be discretionary, but that's going to be just a handful of small organizations. I think it's very interesting what you, what you mentioned, Sonali, and I completely adhere to it. I'm also an LP in one or two funds and also a VC. And there's a huge discussions which are taking place with every single fund, exactly as, as you'd expect, which is the whole idea of being formally an impact fund is actually a constraint which most investors are not prepared to, to buy. And that we can spend hours on that, why or whatever, but that's just a, just a fact. And then the third thing I would add, I'm not trying to be a pro-technology utopian or whatever, and despite being based in San Francisco, I'm actually very you know, skeptical about technology being just point solutions and, and, and not serving a broader purpose um, and driving change. But there is a very interesting function of technology as a supporting role in a world which is radically transparent and traceable. And I think that where technology can help is flesh out elements around supply chain and, and certain disclosures, which whether companies choose or not, you know, tracing plastics and, tra you know, all kinds of things which which can flesh out basically detractors. So long story short, I think the wishful thinking around the you, you know the really huge social impact is gonna be limited because it's too discretionary and that's not the way most 
uh, stakeholders of cables. The regulations are promising as to whether they're fast enough and broad enough, we'll see, but it's, it's a meaningful step. And then there's some very interesting supporting role of technologies that help flesh out perpetrators and, and that, you know, societally can be maybe helpful to, to flesh those out. Yeah, no, I, 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 I want to jump, jump on what you're saying, Roger, because I really want to explain that maybe I didn't convey this properly. There is nothing, my point in saying that investors are returns led is not, is not to suggest that I'm not demonizing them. I'm mm -hmm. simply stating the reality of where they're coming from and that everyone has someone to answer to. And we mm -hmm. we do live in the constraints of our system. Now, as someone who like treads the line between, you know, a realist, but also an activist, I, I can see both sides. But let's let's like let's talk about the second point you mentioned, which is, you know, there are some great wins. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. Europe that is saying like we're gonna pass um you know, greenwashing laws, we're going to pass anti deforestation laws, we're going to start requiring certain metrics to be on the balance sheet. I would say Europe as a whole, the EU specifically, is a leader in all of this regulation when it comes to plastic, when it comes to emissions, when it comes to ESG. There, no one is close to Europe. There are certain states in the US, some of them up and down, but overall, the US is far behind in terms of this kind of, you know, social good regulation and climate good regulation. However, let's maybe take a step back and, and look at what got those regulations to the policy table. And sure. that's where the power of activism and speaking mm -hmm. out, and you talked about technology, let's talk about the good of social media. Social media means that we have climate activists in every town in the world now. We have leaders of indigenous tribes who, have, who are platformed. You mm -hmm. know, we have 16 year olds that become overnight, um, you know, celebrities. For their, for their protests. So absolutely, technology and activism and the utopian believers have brought this change to the table, but it's all part. But I think where we kind of fall down is when we start expecting a VC investor to be an activist. And usually sure. that's not their role. And if there's one thing I've learned of in the world of climate for the last 10 years of being and, and looking at it from the point of view of the media and the investor and the founder and the activist and the communicator. It's that, and again, it comes back to one of my original points around, it, let's look at things collectively. All of these different people and, and archetypes have a role to play in their own way. And, yeah. you know, something I said to someone the other day was don't ask a founder to solve every problem on the planet. And don't ask every interlocutor to solve everything. Now, obviously, in an ideal world, we're part activist, part impact investor, you know, part communicate global communicator, part founder with great ideas and, and technology and community led. But in an imperfect world, it's okay to accept that different archetypes have different roles to play and to kind of accept that, you know, an investor does have to be returns led and they can't go around in the same way that Greta Thunberg can doing her thing. And everyone plays a role. Of course, the activists are hugely important and need way more support. But I just, I just was trying to basically say, let's, let's be real. And I think mm -hmm. the last five months have shown, well, there's no choice. The investor has have had to get real, um, despite what everyone says on LinkedIn, you know? So given where the chips are, where do we go from here? Yeah, no, I completely you know, agree. I, I just want to, I just want to, you know, commend you for bringing up social media because there's, there's a lot of negativity around social media today, but I, I actually think it's one of the, can be one of the major drivers here because what forces change, you know, governments can force change, you know, economics can force change. Um, you know, the capitalistic business goals. But social media, especially in the world we live in today, can really force change also and can call out not only the bad actors, but can also call out the good ones, which in effect can drive business. You know, I used to talk to a lot of people in, in you know, who are very, you know, activist in the, in the, in, in our world. And, you know, they would always say, people should just do the right thing. And I'm like, that's great. That's, I agree. 
but that's not where the majority of the people are. So how do we get them to do the right thing? And that's where you have to have, you know, you can say, look, you can do the right thing and let the whole world know you're doing the right thing. And that becomes very powerful because that drives their business. And then we get change. Anyways, I just thank you for bringing it up because it's, I think it's really important. All that we are sharing is valuable and we can speak about all of this point each uh, three more hours. Um, the thing is we have four minutes left and um, maybe we could have questions from the audience if they have. There's, um, there's a point actually um, from the audience we have. If you have any questions, by the way, we are delighted to have your question and we can debate it from the people were saying that just uh, to Sonali actually that they couldn't connect because the, the link was not properly working but the thing is it's the same link and um, it's open we, it's not restricted so apologies for that for the uh, troubleshooting hopefully we can share the recording you said so I told yeah, the recording that that's that's that sure. they could look at the recording maybe we could uh get benefit from the uh, last minutes to wrap up and um, finish this point maybe. And um... I'm going to follow up one second with Chris was saying, and that's where education comes in, especially in such a fragmented society where a lot of times like it's either black or white. There is no universal truth anymore. Uh, and social media is a very powerful tool. But we also, you know, have to really educate towards these topics uh, so that people don't believe that it doesn't exist. You know, climate change. <laughs> I've heard that one way too many times. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to share your takeaways? before we close the session. Roger, Chris, Sharon, Sonalia. I mean, well, for me, I, please go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was gonna say, and I was just gonna no. say, I, I think the way the, the, the past 10 minutes have developed allowed me to kind of capture the, the key points. And I think um, everybody sort of said very important things. The, probably the most important is also understanding where different constituents come from, what's achievable, not achievable, and kind of connecting the dots and not thinking about things in silos. Um, Thank you for your remarks, Roger. Anyone else? I agree. Uh, other than it was a pleasure, I think that we could stay here and talk for uh, the next five hours about these things. Um, you know, I do believe that it's only, as I said before, the only path forward is through blending many different things from capital to practices. Um, and I hope that, you know, slowly but surely we'll get there. Thank you, Sharon. Awesome. Um, my last point would be that most people I talk to are still blissfully unaware of the connection between food production and the climate crisis. And so if there's any way that anyone listening can help make that connection more clear and just empower people to get involved in any way that, that is interesting to them, whether it's through agriculture or food waste or, or preparing food or or you know, giving a talk at their local, um, at their children's school, or just reading up, or reading Kim Stanley Robinson. I think just making that connection between food production and climate is so key, and and so missing that um, that I think that would be huge progress. So starting right there. And you can check the numbers on Drawdown. Mm -hmm. so I will. I will just conclude with one comment. Um, I mean, first of all, it was it was really fantastic hearing from all of you and your insights. Uh, really, lots lots that I've learned from you. Um, I was giving a, I was hosting a panel last year uh, in Abu Dhabi, um, and one of the speakers, a pretty prominent international scientist, 
in this arena. And we had always said that 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 what we always told people is you must do, you know, baby steps, you know, start somewhere, do something small, get going and, you know, baby steps and that'll lead to more. And he corrected me and he said, no, I disagree. Baby steps were appropriate 10 years ago. We need adult steps now, because if we're all doing baby steps, it's too late for baby steps. So translated you know, this is not happening in some strange, you know, alternative universe. This is our world. It's happening right now. And if we don't take adult steps in whatever way we can do it, um, we're going to be in trouble. So thank you all for your insights. Um, thank you. Pleasure to share this um, 90 minutes with you. It was very eye-opening and it was very um, inspiring. I promise to get in touch with you after the event and connect, trying to connect the dots and continue our debate. I think for now, we're closing the um, session for the time that, that has been giving. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, I'll, everyone. We'll be in touch, probably. Have a very great day. Good luck with the adult steps ahead. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.